Welcome to the second video in semantics. We'll talk about Grice's maxims, implicature, and presupposition, and these are pretty interesting. It talks about conversation more than anything, so even if you're not a huge fan of the theoretical work of linguistics, this is a pretty interesting video that doesn't require all that much theory. So, maxims, what are they? Well, they are used to explain the link between utterances and the meaning of them. And these are all conditions for something called the principle of cooperation, which is a method how humans should interact with each other. And that is, we don't lie, we should say what we mean, we should be relevant, and we want to cooperate with other humans to have conversations that both of us understand. So... These maxims guide that conversation. So, there's four of them. We'll start off with one, the maxim of quality. And that just means be truthful, and if you don't have evidence of something, don't say it. So, we're going to talk a lot about violations. And I would like to give a violation right here. It's easy to come up with sentences that follow them, but there's a lot of sentences in natural conversation that don't follow these maxims. So I'm going to try to give some violating examples for each maxim here. So first, the maxim of quality. Let's talk about one that everyone says. When I went fishing last night, I caught a fish that was the size of an elephant. See, that violates the maxim of quality because we're not being truthful. What about, hmm, Mary won the lottery last night. You know, if Mary did win the lottery last night, it would be truthful, but likely she didn't. Now, what if we lack evidence of something? For instance, every sentence in the universe is actually made up of English words. Now, this could theoretically be true, but we don't have evidence for it. So why would we say it? Or for instance, what about a concept in mathematics? That every factorial can be written as a polynomial. And that, you know, I don't know. Do you know? You probably don't know. So why would you say it? And that is violating the maxim of quality. The second maxim we have here is the maxim of quantity. And... This just means don't contribute more or less than you need to. So for instance, if I say, how do you bake a cake? And then you respond, well, you put it in the oven. You're violating that maxim because you're not contributing as much information as you need to. Or if I say, how is your day going? And you say, well, it's going okay. I went to the zoo, pet a dinosaur. I went home. Then I laid in bed, I had a nap, watched some TV, and then my brother called and he talked to me about his trip to New York last weekend. That is clearly violating the maximum quantity because that person is contributing way more than they need to. I just said, how's your day going? That, all I'm looking for is an adjective response. So that is a violation of the maximum of quantity. Of course, there were some quality violations in there too. You don't pet a dinosaur. Sorry, it's not, it's not possible. The third maxim here is the maxim of relevance. And it's pretty straightforward. Be relevant. I mean, relevance is probably something we're looking for. For instance, if I say, Hey man, can you help me with this math problem? I don't really know how to do it. And they say, yeah, you know what? The Born Identity was a really good film. I mean, other than violating the maximum of quality there for truthfulness. <laughs> Kidding. Uh, they're not relevant at all. I ask them about a math problem, and they come out and they say, hey, yeah, how about this movie that I saw? That's completely violating the maximum of relevance. So, this leads us to our fourth maxim, which is the maxim of manner. And this is a very interesting one. Be clear, be brief, avoid ambiguity, and be orderly. 
So if I say, how does Descartes prove the existence of God? And you hand me an essay that has an argument that is all over the place, repeats lines, and typically looks like something a grade 7 would write, then you're probably violating the maxim of manner because you're not being clear, you're not being orderly, and you're kind of going all over the place. So another example would be if I said, yes, I went to the zoo in New York last night. When I went to the zoo in New York last night, I saw a bunch of bears. And in that zoo in New York, when I went to the bear cage, I saw a bear eat another bear. That is something that is not being brief. It's clear, but it's not brief at all. It's repeating things over and over. It's not being concise. And that would be a violation of the maxim of manner. So right now you're probably saying, okay, hold on a second. All these things are things we use in real life and conversation, and they violate these maxims. Why do we have these maxims if, if we violate them all the time? Shouldn't we be, I don't know, being truthful to these? And the interesting answer is no. These are principles that support the principle of cooperation. And if we had to talk like robots or talk to computers, then we'd probably want to follow these. For instance, if we program a computer to talk to us and give us information, we probably want a computer to follow these maxims because it would be beneficiary for us. But we don't. And if we did, conversation would be so boring. Oh, how's your day? Good. What did you do? Well, I went to the zoo. Like, you couldn't ask questions back. In fact, you could hardly even ask questions because you'd be kind of violating maxims, in a sense. For instance, if I say, Oh man, you look so tired. What happened last night? Well, I'm not really being all that concise in that question, I'm making an observation and then asking a question based on the observation, when really, I should just ask the question. So, I'm also violating things right now because clearly I'm rambling on forever, I'm not, uh, I'm not staying on topic necessarily. I'm on topic, but I'm repeating things, I'm going off on tangents, I'm giving examples. For some of you, I'm giving more than you need, for some I'm giving less, so I am violating these maxims, and it's a nice conversation to have. In fact, what's interesting is I specifically put in this word forever here, if I say I could rabble on forever, well, I'm being ambiguous there. In fact, I'm, I'm being untruthful there, because forever is forever. Eventually, I'll stop recording, and thus I am not rambling on forever. So another violation right there. So you violate these all the time. It's okay. You're supposed to. That's how conversation works. So let's move on to the next topic. Implicature. And this comes from the word implication. I, I don't think that's hard to see. Hopefully you made that connection. But implication is the hidden meaning in a sentence. So for instance, if I'm at a conference or something, or at an assembly, and I'm looking at some student stand up there giving a speech, he finishes his speech, and I turn to my friend and I say, well, he's pretty good at being pretty. There is some hidden meaning in there, and I'm basically saying, yeah, this speech was terrible, but I didn't explicitly say it. So it was an implication in the sentence that his speech was terrible. Or, for instance, you meet up with your old friend Courtney after not seeing her for two years, and you say, oh, hey, Courtney, have you stopped running since we talked last? Uh, you're probably implying there that she's gotten a little fat, but you don't want to say that. In fact, we use implicature all the time in our daily sentences because sometimes we want to be mean, but we don't want to explicitly say it, so this is a socially acceptable way of saying things. Now, I'm not saying this is good or bad, but... This is just a linguistic term we use in semantics. Now, there's one final thing to talk about that I did touch on in the overview, 
and that is presupposition. And presupposition is when you assume things in your sentences. For instance, if I say, do you regret stealing that car? If you say no, you just admitted to stealing a car. If you say yes, you've also admitted to stealing a car. So this keyword regret here implies that you've already done it. And that is presupposing. That is a pre a presuppositive sentence. That is a very hard word to say. But this is something that they don't allow in courts because it's bad. You're trapping a defendant into admitting something when he didn't really want to admit it. For instance, here's another question that's a little bit more subtle. Would you like to do it again? And the key word here is again, because this implies that you've already done it once. So if I say, do you regret stealing that car? And the defendant says, wait, I've never stolen a car. Then some time could go by and the lawyer could once again say, would you like to do it again? Or would you ever do it again? And then he suddenly slips up and says, no, I'd never do it again. They got him right there because he just admitted to already doing it once before. And, you know, in the linguistics and the law, which is, you know, it's another thing you can take or read about. This is huge. This is making lawyers stick to not using these types of sentences because there is hidden meaning in these sentences. There are assumptions that aren't being explicitly made. So... We, again, we use this all the time in language, and sometimes we're not aware of it. And that can get really tricky, because people can admit to things that they never actually did. This is what police officers do all the time. They're very good at using these types of sentences. And, of course, they say, you know, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in court. So... When you're dealing with the police, it's best to just invoke your right of silence because they're going to get you with these words. Regret, again, and there are many other words that you can probably think of on your own. So, that was this lecture. We're almost done semantics. Well, we actually are done semantics, but next time we have a special semantic syntax hybrid about thematic roles. And these are giving different meanings to parts of sentences and seeing how they interact in syntax. Of course, we won't be covering the syntactic component because that requires a much deeper understanding of rules, x-bar theory. But an introduction to thematic roles will definitely help you when you go into later courses. So, as always, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below and I will answer them the best that I can.